right. Well, thank you all for being here today and still being here in the afternoon. Um, the River Torrens is a, an iconic backdrop to Adelaide. It runs through the centre of our city and you're probably all very familiar with the fact that the River Torrens um, does suffer the ill effects of cyanobacteria uh, or as it's more commonly known, blue-green algae, particularly during summer. So uh, the question is, what do we do about this? Uh, today I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of the work that's been done over the last five years in trialling two different strategies to try and manage blue-green algae. So um, I'll ask you to just keep in mind though that these are just two of the short to medium term strategies that we've been developing and that they're part of a bigger multi-pronged approach to catchment management and river management. Um, that includes short term, medium term and long term initiatives. Um, it's probably important that we understand some of the drivers behind why we want to have strategies to manage blue-green algae. Um, these include uh, wanting to minimise the public health risks, uh, to um, improve the general amenity along the river corridor from the hills to the sea, trying to achieve some of our economic priorities for the state, particularly because there are so many state, um, national and international events held in Adelaide during uh, summer season. And also we want to improve the aquatic ecosystem health of the river. So, blue-green algae. Uh, this, uh, this is an image taken in, uh, I think it was January 2013. Um, I guess you could ask, what's, what's the problem around blue-green algae? And you can see it there. It's, uh, it's bright green, it's pretty ugly to a lot of people. Um, it can be quite smelly and it can be quite toxic. So one of the ways that we manage uh, the public health risks associated with blue-green algae is to close Torrens Lake if the blue-green algae levels reach certain thresholds. Um, that essentially, by limiting people's access with the water, it limits and, and reduces the actual health implications. The issue there is that it doesn't meet some of those other drivers that I mentioned earlier. It just sort of ticks off the public health one. So um, what we've wanted to do is look at other strategies that will tick all of the driver boxes that we're looking for. Um, this particular year, uh, Adelaide had had a really long run of hot, dry weather. There hadn't been a lot of rainfall. And the blue-green algae that was in the lake at that point in time was actually growing really rapidly, a lot quicker than historical averages would suggest. So um, this particular year, there was, I guess what you'd say, optimum conditions for growth. And if you've been at the conference for the last day and a half, you would have heard a lot of people talking about blue-green algae and the perfect conditions being still warm water, thermal stratification, and lots of nutrients for food. And the River Torrens, and Torrens Lake in particular, is just that. It is perfect for blue-green algae growth. So um, you take this, and then you compare it to this, which was an image that was taken earlier this year. Um, we actually haven't had any Torrens Lake closures, uh, the ones we do for public health reasons, since 2013. So that image I showed just before was the last one that we'd had where it's looked really bad and green and slimy. The reason for that is because we have been trialling uh, what we've termed dilution flows. Um, you might ask, what is a dilution flow? Well, it's a type of environmental flow that we use during the summer period, released from upstream reservoirs, um, flowing down the river, basically to improve the amenity and uh, the general water quality of the system. So, in the trials that we've been running, what we wanted to do was test the efficacy of using water flows uh, to lower the blue-green algae levels. Uh, but also to refine the amount of water that we would need and the times of year that we, or the number of times a year that we would need to release that water. So uh, dilution flows essentially will freshen up the water in, in a river system um, or in the river torrent system. Um, they'll also reduce the water temperatures, um, promote some mixing, so get rid of that thermal stratification that you get in Torrens Lake, and they'll also dilute the already present algal population, hence their name. So the way they work, um, we started trialling these in 2011 and we started by releasing water from uh, Hope Valley Reservoir, which, forgive me if I'm, oh there is there, 
uh, at 40 megalitres a day. Uh, that ran for about 10 to, to 12 days at a time, a couple of times during the summer. And while we found that the results were quite promising, uh, we did, as you saw in that very first photo, get algal blooms in the early years between 2011 and 2013. So what we did from late 2013 onwards was to start releasing flows from Kangaroo Creek Reservoir, which is slightly further um, up into the, the catchment and the river system, so it's, it's sort of up here actually just off the image, sorry about that, um, at a flow rate of 150 megalitres a day for four to five days at a time and doing that a couple of times during the summer season. The water flows um, from Kangaroo Creek down past Gorge Weir, which is the first uh, blue dot there that you see on the, the image on uh, your right, and it flows downstream through Torrens Lake uh, and then through the western suburbs, through Breakout Creek and out the outlet at West Beach. A big component of the trial has been collecting water data and analysing that data. Um, and each of these little dots that you see on the image here is a, a monitoring site. There's a huge concentration there in Torrens Lake, obviously. We've got um, a real... Uh, driver, I suppose, to monitor right through the city centre there. Um, so what we found, and apparently I've got some more photos before we get there, <laughs> this is actually just a, a picture of what 150 megalitres a day looks like flowing over the city we are. Um, that was taken in December 2015. This is what it looks like flowing downstream. Um, so you can see that it's, it's just a nice freshening flow through the river system. Um, we also did find um, that as well as uh, promoting the dilution and the maintaining low levels of blue-green algae in Torrens Lake, that there were benefits through the whole river system. Uh, this is a photo taken from uh, Breakout Creek, looking upstream along Breakout Creek. And you can see that having that river flow is actually quite an amenity benefit through the river system. And this is the water flowing out to sea at West Beach. These were all taken during a dilution flow this year um, and are all examples, uh, real examples of the flow impact. This is some of the, uh, the results from the summer just gone. So uh, this graph summarises, um, well, it, it shows the amount of water that's flowing down the river. Um, so these blue lines here are the river flow and this green line up here is the average total blue-green algae in the River Torrens. Actually in the Torrens Lake there were uh, seven monitoring sites that were averaged to get that, that green line. Uh, we released a total of 2.46 gigalitres of water during the 15-16 summer season and you can see that was released over four, um, four periods there the dark blue spikes um, are representative of that. And what you can see is an immediate reduction in the algae levels after each of the dilution flow releases. The lighter blue spikes that you see in between um, are river flows that came as a consequence of rainfall events. Um, they're substantially higher than what we can generate out of our um, reservoir releases. And that is really around uh, the water availability for what we're doing and also the amount of water that we need. We're only using what we need. What we found in this, um, in evaluating this year, just gone, and um, all of the previous years of data that we collected is that whether it be a natural rainfall event or a controlled release from a reservoir, we need a flow in the river system about every 21 days to maintain low levels of blue-green algae. Otherwise, what we find is that the algae starts to grow again. And that, I mean, that is dependent on weather conditions. So the, the warmer it is, the still conditions, um, it will grow more rapidly. Um, and so we, in our trial, collected not just water data, but kept an eye on uh, atmos atmospheric um, temperatures and wind speeds and, and um, all sorts of data. I didn't want to bomboozle you with too much of it today. The other thing I did mention earlier was that the dilution flows 
um, dropped the water temperature in the water column and also removed the thermal stratification in Torrens Lake. So one of the things we did <clears throat> during the trial was to install temperature thermistors at three locations in Torrens Lake. Uh, this is an example of two of those, um, two of those points during December 2015. And what you see is um, what naturally occurs in, in the lake. The shallower water will be quite high in temperature. It can be almost the same as air temperature, around 30 degrees. Um, and the deeper you get into the water column, the cooler the water gets. So there's quite a range through there, similarly up here. This bit here is where you see one of our dilution flows passing through the lake. The water temperature through the water column um, becomes more uniform and the temperature also drops. So um, we're seeing in real time, in real data, um, the flows doing exactly what we thought they would do theoretically. We also collected a lot of data through the river system from Gorge Weir down to the beach, as you saw on that image before the map with all the data points, um, collection points. And this is just a really quick scatter plot of all of the blue-green algae levels during the summer uh, plotted against flow. And you'll see a, a general similar pattern um, to what we saw for the graph from the lake in that you've got higher um, blue-green algae levels uh, pre and during flows and then uh, lower ones after flows. It also kind of showed that there is a prevalence of blue-green algae through the whole river system. It's not something that we're moving from Torrens Lake downstream. Now, I did promise that I'd talk about two strategies. So the next one is hydrogen peroxide. Um, this is, an, is something else that we've been trialling. Hydrogen peroxide is an algicide. Um, blue-green algae are more susceptible to hydrogen peroxide than other aquatic biota. So what we were hoping to test is at what concentrations we could essentially kill blue-green algae without harming other aquatic biota in the Torrens. This was a pretty exciting um, uh, project for us. It's an Australia first to trial hydrogen peroxide as an algicide in a natural river system and recreational water body. So we wanted to do it in the right way and uh, we staged the, uh, the trial that we did with this, uh, beginning first in the laboratory and then moving on to test pools. This is an image of the pools that we constructed. Um, we filled these with water from Torrens Lake um, that had a couple of different species of blue-green algae present. Uh, we then added some test fish and snails and other aquatic biota to, to see the um, ecotoxicology impacts to what we were doing. And we applied hydrogen peroxide um, at two concentrations, two milligrams per litre and 10 milligrams per litre and had a suite of control pools where we added no chemical. What we found was that at the two milligrams per litre there wasn't too much impact to the aquatic biota, but at 10 milligrams per litre we started to get um, quite high rates of inactivity in the snails and um, mortality in the shrimp. The fish seemed okay at all concentrations. Blue-green algae, um, at both the concentrations, we saw a decrease in the levels of blue-green algae in the pools. So essentially what we got from this trial was that by using a concentration of around about two milligrams per litre, we could kill off the blue-green algae but cause minimal, if, no, if not no harm, to the other aquatic biota. So the next fun stage was to move into the lake proper. And we did trial that early this year. Um, and this is an image of uh, their team out in the boat um, during the dosing. We did it in a con confined area, so you can see just back there there's a floating boom on the surface of uh, the water. Below that is an aquatic silt curtain, and we use that to contain the area just by the city we are. Uh, we got pretty good results in terms of the dosing concentration of the chemical. Um, there were minimal, if not no, impacts to the test snails and macroinvertebrates used, but significant rainfall kind of interfered with our blue-green algae data collection. So we don't have a full data set there, but it is very promising for next summer. So we're still trialling that one, and that's uh, still pretty exciting to all of us involved. So um, that is my presentation. And I suppose before I take questions, I just want to say thank you to SA Water, EPA, uh, Adelaide City Council, SA Health, Gordon Institute, Uni of Adelaide, all of the partners in this project, and there are a lot of them, so I did name them all on my abstract submission if you care to read it. <laughs> Thanks.
Catherine. Cool. Um, maybe one type, one quick question. If someone's got one. Yeah. I, I was curious. What's the um, that those volumes of the the, the 150 meg a day in four or five days? That's about you know 600. 600 to 700 megalitres total. What's the volume of the lake? 400 megalitres, okay. roughly. Yep. So. There is some system losses in the river, so not all of that does actually pass through um, the lake. Um, but